All right, guys. Um, okay, now it's pretty open the iPad. Hold on a second. All right, I have no idea. All right, so I tried to do this on the. Check. <clears throat> All right, so I tried to do it on the iPod. Yeah, but it won't switch the camera. So I am going to try to do this with the MacBook. All right, so I wanted to go over the antimicrobial lab. And just remember, we did our disinfectants on a nutrient auger plate, and we did that. Um, we took the plate and divided it in two. We put E. coli on one side and staph on the other. And remember, I asked you guys, well, why would we specifically pick E. coli and staph? All right. And I could have picked any two different types of bacteria, but remember, we picked a gram negative and a gram positive. We wanted to see, we used the same disinfectant. We wanted to see the effectiveness of the, um, antimicrobial, whatever disinfectants you picked on, on your disc um, to see the effectiveness on an E. coli or Staph aureus, one was gram negative and one was gram positive. So we just kind of wanted to see uh, if, you know, one was effective on one and not on the other, or was it actually effective on both? And uh, someone brought in like Fabrioso, that uh, cleaner that smells great. It was totally ineffective and, um, Someone brought in some mouthwash, which was relatively effective. Hydrogen peroxide was really effective. Bleach worked. Um, I'm back, guys, one second. So, yeah, we wanted to try that out. Um, so, remember, we divided it in two. We did gram negative and gram positive. Now, on the antimicrobials, we did them on the Mueller Hinton plate for the Kirby Bauer simulation. And remember, we used that McFarland tube that had that turbidity. And we kind of made sure that when we were culturing all of those, Sorry, when we were culturing um, the step or acing color, we wanted to make sure that we were when we were inoculating those colonies into the, the broth that the turbidity was equal or visually equal to the McFarland tube so that when we plated all of it, we could assume that the concentration of the bacteria was very similar. So across the board, standardized for all of us. So we used that Mueller Hinton plate. And we um, did one with E. coli, one with Staph aureus, so one was gram positive, one was gram negative, and then we used the different antibiotics, and they were labeled um, initial, uh, and would tell us the antibiotic, and then the the concentration. <clears throat> All right, and remember too that even if the zone of inhibition was bigger in one than the other, we have to factor in. Was it working on cell wall? Was it working on um, ribosomal RNA? Is it working on um, DNA? Is it working at like a sulfidomide? Is it working on folic acid? Is it working on like polymyxins? Is it working on the cell membrane? We try to figure out different modes of action for the different uh, antibiotics. And just because something was very effective on the Kirk B. Bauer test on the Mueller Hinton. Um, Auger doesn't mean that it's going to be effective in the body too. Remember, this was I got some plates here. I'll show you in a second. I did this one with staff, this one with E. coli, and I'll flip the camera around and see if I can uh, get this on here. But when I come back um, tomorrow, I think well, Dr. Bell is going to pull this out of the incubator tomorrow, and then they'll be ready Monday. Um, to see the results uh, and you know, maybe you'll see these on the lab practical. I haven't really decided exactly what we're going to do. But remember that even if the zone of inhibition is huge on here or here, it doesn't really matter. 
it's effective on the plate doesn't mean it's going to be 100% effective on the patient because everybody's different. I mean, we're all similar, but everyone reacts to different antibiotics differently. So uh, we also, have to, like I said, we have to factor in, um, you know, my word great here, but not um, in the body. And just because something works great here, we could say, well, the patient is also, um, you know, the patient's four, the patient is 90, or the patient um, has um, comorbidities or something. So we have to factor in um, the, the different uh, things, you know, age, comorbidities, and things like that to figure out which antimicrobial <clears throat> would be the best, just because it's the most effective on the plate. Number one doesn't mean it's going to work as well in the body. And number two, uh, it may not be the best antibiotic for the patient. And three, the other thing is the patient may have a reaction to it or may have had a reaction in the past. And remember, too, that once you, the first time you take an antimicrobial, um, <clears throat> you may not have a reaction the first time, um, but you may the second time because you have antibodies to it or you have an allergic reaction to it. So even if the pharmacist comes out and asks you um, any questions, have you taken this antibody before? Say, oh no, I've taken it before, no problems. Well, the second time around, you could have a problem. All right, uh, usually not the first, but the second time around, you could possibly. So there's always that uh, contingency. So I'm going to see if I can switch this a little bit. God, you think I'd have this down pat by now? And even get rid of this fake background, which I don't want. All right. <clears throat> so I'm going to just go through this. All right. So here is this way. Okay, so I'm hoping this will record when the camera's over here. There it is. All right, so here's our plates. And if you look, the disc should be the same. So this, um, this one here is E. coli, gram negative. This one is staph aureus, gram positive. Right? And um, I had a student in today asking you know, some questions. And I said, well, what's the difference between staph and E. coli, and they had no idea what I was talking about. So just remember, one is gram negative, one's gram positive, and the cell wall structure is completely different. So the mode of action of the antimicrobial may be different. Right. <clears throat> so I literally have. Uh, e erythromycin on here, penicillin, streptomycin, chloroamphenicol, and tetracycline. Now, we've probably sure we've all heard of tetracycline, streptomycin, penicillin. So, penicillin basically is going to, um, it's going to work on the invisible. You know, it's a fake background. So, we'll get you back together. I think that will work, right? Okay, so um, penicillin works on the um, cell wall. All right, so if this has a um, beta lactan or some kind of, uh, if it's a uh, staph aureus or something that has a, a lot of, um, Variance factors, or it's able to break down penicillin, even if it's generation one, two, or three. Um, the penicillin or the antimicrobial will not be able to break down the man and ag units uh, and break away that cell wall and disrupt the osmotic pressure. So it'll be relatively ineffective. And the other ones that I use, um, sorry, everyone, this isn't working out so great. Um, Streptomycin and tetracycline and chloroamphenicol. They all really work on ribosomes. So um, it might be the 30S or 50S. It doesn't really matter at this point. You know, some may um, uh, stop it from connecting. Uh, it might jam up the, the 
the codon sequence um, where the ribosomes come together. So it's going to jam up um, something with reading the codons and uh, producing those uh, amino acids in a certain order to make a protein. So just remember, if it if the bacteria can't make the proteins um, or any protein, it, eventually it'll die. So the whole point of the antimicrobial is to make sure that the bacteria will at some point not be able to replicate. That's really kind of how it's going to work. All right. So I'm going to try to, I'm going to pause this now. I think if I can recording in progress, click on the recorder to manage the recording. So I'm going to pause it. Okay. So, all right. So um, I got rid of a invisible background or whatever that craziness was. So, just, I'm, I'm sure I put this in lecture and lab, and I know I have them out for uh, lab. So just go in or go Google uh, search images like uh, antimicrobial modes of action, just so you have an idea what I'm talking about. If you don't have me for lecture, I know I did it uh, in lecture, um, like week four or whatever. So I'm hoping that uh, if you don't have me for lecture, or, um, you know what I'm talking about, or if you have me for lecture and you haven't watched the videos or you know whatever the, the issue is, you should at least know why we're doing this. And I was talking to a couple of students uh, last night and today, and I wasn't um, lecturing them, but I just wanted to point out that there's no point in doing the experiments if you don't know why we're doing it, what's the point? So please realize why we picked um, whichever medium we use. So whether it is, um, you know, mannitol salt. So just don't say, oh, it's the MSA plate and not know that's mannitol salt auger. So why we pick that? Is it selective for um, heliophiles or um, something that can live in a higher salt concentration. So mannitol salt auger. So remember it has a 7% uh, salt percentage. So it inhibits the growth of pretty much um, all organisms um, that would live in this temperature range anyway. They can't handle that kind of salt concentration, but staph can, but it's also differential because of the mannitol um, alcohol sugar. Staph aureus will consume it that there's a pH indicator. If it's consuming the um, alcohol sugar, it's going to ferment it, uh, lower the pH, increase the acidity, and the plate will turn pink from pink to yellow. So we know that if uh, it consumes the mannitol salt auger, or mannitol alcohol sugar, it's going to change the auger to yellow. All right, so we know what staph aureus. And we also know that staph aureus, aureus means yellow. So generally staph aureus will be yellowish in color. So staph epididymis or epidermis or however you want to pronounce it is also staph. It doesn't have quite as many virulence factors um, as staph aureus and it doesn't consume mannitol sugar. So it will grow on the plate because it can tolerate the salt concentration but it won't consume the alcohol sugar and it won't ferment it, it won't change the pH. So the plate will stay pink. All right, the other thing I want you guys to sort of remember is we did the um, peroxide test, all right? And both Staph Epi and Staph Aureus were bubbling. So that was a way of dealing with the oxygen um, and the hydrogen peroxide. Right, so it has a way of dealing with it's a virulence factor. It has a way of dealing with that. Remember, all oxygen is toxic, even to us. So if we don't have a way of dealing with it, uh, it's very toxic. That's why um, strictly um, anaerobic bacteria have to live deep in tissues. They can't tolerate like cross or uh, um, yeah, crossing perfringes, gas, gangrene um, can't live in an oxygen concentration. So it lives deep in your tissues, and if we Hit that with oxygen that we can kill it. Uh, and also remember we did the, the coagulase test with that uh, rabbit plasma and we inoculated it with staph uh, epi and staph aureus. All right, and then we did a control uh, with nothing. 
Um, and if it had worked, um, staph aureus would have coagulated the plasma. We would have seen that fibrous um, coagulation. Unfortunately, it didn't work. Um, I think the, I don't know if the um, coagulase was uh, too old or, or what the issue was, but it didn't work. But that was another way we could, we could differentiate uh, staph aureus from staph epididymis. We could just do it on a mantle um, auger plate, or we could have, you know, used um, coagulase um, rabbit plasma and figure that out. But I wanted to go over to that. So also know um, we did McConkie plates. Remember McConkie was um, selective for gram negative, All right? So gram positive usually don't grow on it. It's got a little bit of um, methylene blue in it, and I think it has a little bit of bile in it, um, which inhibits a lot of the gram positives. Same as bile in your uh, digestive tract. Right? You know, everyone thinks that bile is just there to break down fat. It's also inhibitory for gram positive bacteria to some degree. But we used the um, McConkie agar, which was also red. All right. It's inhibitory for gram positive. It only really likes to grow gram negative. And then remember, if the uh, bacteria was able to ferment, was able to um, consume um, lactose, all right, it was, it turned the, the colonies would be pink or purple. If it wasn't able to, the colonies were white. All right, so it's, um, it's, selective and um, differential uh, and to some degree there. And I also wanted to go over the Enterobacteriaceae test. I, and I told you guys, you probably would never um, do it um, in real life because now they're gonna just use the wells, sort of like the ELISA test. It'll give you, um, you know, it'll tell you exactly what it is and what antimicrobial um, will work best and you can get those results in, in a few hours rather than going through what we did with all the tubes. But remember I said with the enterobacteriaceae, um, they're all gram negative, they're all enteric, which means they live in your digestive tract. And they all look very, very similar um, morpho morphologically on slides and even colonies look very, very similar. Um, and kind of remember too that um, even if you had an infection or something, it may not be just one microbe. You may be um, you may have a compound uh, infection. It might be more than one organism, and it likely is. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out that I know I talked to you guys in lab about was the enterics are generally fine if they're in the digestive tract. It's when they get into the respiratory tract or the um, urinary tract or the reproductive tract, um, the eye, someplace where they don't normally belong, you can start seeing some major, major problems. But anyway, um, I've got the racks here. I'm just going to randomly pull these up and just kind of, all right, so triple sugar iron. Right. So remember, this has got three sugars, glucose, lactose, sucrose, and we talked about uh, it's always going to consume the glucose first, and then the lactose and the sucrose. And if it consumes the sugar and it ferments it, and whenever it ferments, it's going to produce an acid. It's going to have a pH indicator. And this was going to be yellow. If it was yellow here, that means it definitely consumed the glucose. If it's yellow all the way up, remember I said it was very, very hungry, very, very voracious appetite. It consumed glucose, lactose, and sucrose. So this should all be yellow. Or if it's just yellow and um, a little bit of orange, all right, we would you know, uh, say, well, there's acid here, it turns yellow, nothing here. So if it's um, yellow all the way up, acid, acid, it consumed all of it. Right? Okay, the other one, we did the Sims citrate agar. Remember this one? was supposed to turn really super beautiful blue and um, 
Simmons citrate auger was differential for bacteria that could consume the carbon um, and the citrate. Right? It doesn't uh, didn't have to have C6, uh, H12O6. It didn't have to have sugar, any type of sugar as its carbon source. Right? So this differential for that. And if it consumed the citrate, it went from green to blue. And I know the shades were pretty close, but uh, usually it's a a very very deep blue. And then we did um, the sim media. I remember sim. I wrote them for it up there. Remember it said it was sulfide indole motility. All right, so sulfide would actually change. You'd have the sulfide production. Um, which would turn a little bit there. All right, a little bit black. All right, indole. Remember indole. If it was able to um, use the amino acid tryptophan, it would turn to indole. We had the indicator for that. And remember, we had the stab line in there. And if it was, um, we stabbed it. And if it was fuzzy, or well, we were able to look in there and see if the stab line changed, we knew that it had flagella. It was mobile. It had, you know, I asked, I went and asked all you guys, well, what does that mean? And a lot of you were right on it and said, well, that means it has. Jello. And this one has maybe see that stab line. Can't read what that was. Proteus definitely you can see that stab line is huge. So we know it spread. Um, I actually have, if you guys want to see, I have Proteus I put on um, blood auger, and you can see that actually swarming. That's um, differential for um, Proteus. Okay. So, guys. Mobile there. Um, and remember, I talked about the oxygen concentration from the top down into the stab line. There should be more anaerobic, the oxygen concentration would be lower in there. Right. And then we, you know, I asked, you remember, I said these were slants, and why would we inoculate just the top of this? Well, because the oxygen concentration is different on the top as opposed to stabbing it. Into the deep or um, into the, the butt, we really call it the butt. All right. And the last one we, we, we did the MRVP. Remember, we inoculated that and then overnight while it was going through binary fission. Then we divided it in two. We did the methyl red test and the Vogue's power. Remember, methyl red was um, determined glucose uh, fermentation. So that would have this had a pH indicator in it and that changed. Um, the super bright red, and we knew it fermented a lot of glucose. And if the Vogue's power test was positive, we know it went from glucose right into acetone, just went right through the acetone. So a totally different test. Um, and somebody asked me the specifics, and I honestly, I don't, I wasn't biochem, I mean, I took it, but I ran as fast as I could when I graduated, or when I, when I passed that class. Um, so anyway, there's that. I'm going to pause this again. I want to get um, an ELISA test and just kind of go over a little bit of the basics with that. So, so. all right. So um, here were the wells for the ELISA test, and I'm thinking what I think I want to do right now is I'm going to just kind of run up to the board, um, just kind of draw it out and kind of verbally. If this works, I apologize if it doesn't. Kind of go over the ELISA test briefly, not getting into a lot of detail on it. So I will try. So, say this is our well here. Remember, we did this in three. One, two. 
number five. Two more rows of three. So we've got one, two, three, five, six wells here. Remember, this was our positive control. This is our negative control. So I had a student in today. I was kind of going over the exam and like what was all this about. So remember, we are checking for a very specific antigen. Right? This is going to be something foreign. So this test, when we do the ELISA test, it's going to be specific for a one specific antigen. So I think in lab we did Lyme's disease, but we could have done HIV or. Um, but anyway, we're looking for an antigen, which would be theoretically on your cell. There would be something for it. Uh, let's use these simple markers here. And we want to check, see if you have the antibody to it. So you know, the antibody, you guys, hopefully, remember, you say the, the, um, the heavy chain, the light chain, where the antibody attaches to. So, we would say that theoretically these would touch here. So we're actually testing for an antibody. So with our positive, this is our positive control. So our negative. And I asked the student today, so what does this mean? And they said, what changes color? Well, yeah, it does change color, but our positive control is we have a patient or we have blood serum that we know specifically has the antibody we're searching for. So this should this should light up in color. This serum doesn't have the antibody. We know that. So we know what a positive test will look like, nor a negative test. Will look. Because our positive control has the antibody we're looking for, the negative control we know doesn't. Then we have patient. Six. So we do some threes just so we have a backup. So we take the blood serum from patient one, put it from here, 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 patient two, here, 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 three, here, 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 here. Or three, one, two, three, four, five, six, doesn't really matter. As long as you know what you're doing. Here, here. And then when it changes color, and then the test, we know that that patient or that blood serum had the antibody we're looking for. All right. But remember, we had to do the antigen. So I'll just put the antigen triangle. When we started, we literally put the antigen, what we're testing for in every single body. Okay. Then we came in, our positive control was the blood serum of somebody we knew had the antibody to the antigen, so it bound there. We knew if this patient didn't have the antibody there, so we, nothing that was up in the body. Here. Then we had to put our secondary antibody in, did that. Our secondary antibody in. So, the reason we did that, remember, I said that we put our secondary antibody in to attach to the primary antibody and the patient's serum, and our cleaving enzyme is able to attach to the secondary antibody. We know that, right? So that cleaving enzyme will cleave if the secondary antibody is attached to the primary antibody, and when we put the cleaving enzyme in, it will cause the color change. So let's just say we did this. And in lab, I think we had, oh, I think I'll do it just so we see, look, it's the same t-shirt for that. One, two, three, four, five, six. I think that's how we did it. And remember, patient four 
was the same color as that control. So we know this patient had the antibody to the antigen we're searching for. We know that. But Dr. Bailey and I made sure that number two, or I'm sorry, uh, patient number six was slightly Possible. So we had a little bit of a color change, all right. And I asked you guys specifically, well, what would that mean if this patient had a little bit of color? So um, there was one of two things that could have happened. Number one is they had whatever this we're testing for. So we're testing for Lyme disease. You say, well, they, they had Lyme disease in the past, way in the past. And they had some residual antibodies to it from their memory plasma cells. I remember I went over um, injury presenting cells and CD4 cells and how they you know, activate the B cells and the IE B cells and um, triaging in the plasma cells and things like that. I went over that, but not for at this point. Remember that they were slightly positive, so we know they had community at some point, it might be waning a little bit. Or the other option is they just recently got exposed to it. And we talked about immunoglobins and blood titers. So they were just recently exposed to it, but their blood titers haven't um, elevated enough because it's their initial um, exposure to it. So remember with initial exposure, it takes it takes seven to 14 days for your blood titer antibodies, you know, we're talking about IgM, IgG, IgA, IgE, to elevate enough um, to show up as a, a completely positive test. Right? Oh yeah. So remember, when you have when you have your your antibodies to it, or you have your memory cells to it. You automatically have the recipe. So that we, we talked about. You know, why would you get vaccinated? Well, when you get vaccinated, so you're exposed to the antigen, you produce antibodies to it, and you want to produce those memory cells to it. So the next time you get exposed to it, you have your full blood titer up and running in 48 to 72 hours, rather than waiting for that initial. 7 to 14 days. That was kind of the point. So just remember, positive test for ELISA would mean that um, you, your positive control has the antibodies that you find the specific antigen. You add the secondary antibody to it, binds to that, and then the cleaving enzyme binds to the secondary, secondary um, antibody that attaches to the primary antibody. So if you're uh, Patient serum is the same as the positive control. We know that they have the antibodies to the specific antibody we're testing for. And if it comes out slightly positive, we know that there had fire exposure maybe a long time ago and it's weaned, 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 or they just got recent exposure and their blood fibers aren't up all of it. All right. Um, you're part of the exam. I'm just going for a second. Just remember the rest of the exam is going to be uh, that multiple choice and the um, compare and contrast. And remember, always give us, Dr. Bailey and I, we want to, whatever you can tell us, we want a full explanation, not just, you know, whatever, I mean, give us whatever you can, but the, the more you give us, the more points you're going to get. So we're asking the question to say, do they do they understand the concept of why um, or the concept behind whatever the question is? All right. There's um, I put a bonus question on there with five points. Um, you guys should all know that we went over that um, in lab unofficially, sort of. We kind of went over that. I asked you guys a question. And remember, um, in lab, if, if Dr. Bear and I asked you guys a question, there was a reason behind it. We're, we're kind of letting you know that these are probably important concepts. 
All right, so I babbled on for 36 minutes now. So I'm going to upload this into uh, the master course and then we'll uh, split it out. Um, so you guys have an idea uh, what's going to be on practical, what we're expecting. Um, yes. yes. <sighs> Yeah. And then uh, also remember we did the, the lab with the fungi tape on the, the, the molds and fungus. So just kind of realize how you would differentiate the different molds and fungus from, um, you know, we saw them physically and the, and the, um, the actual tubes. Then you guys brought your plates in, you took the fungi tape and you um, put a uh, very specific lacto blue dye on there, all right, and stained it and looked under the microscope. So you realize you really should know the structure of the molds or fungus. Remember, they're dimorphic, mold in the cold, yeast in the beast. So you need to know what the mycelium is, the hypha, sporangiform, or, uh, you know, how do they, <clears throat> uh, molds or fungus, are there spores, are they budding, um, things like that. Um, you should have gotten it in lecture at some point. And it's in lab. Um, and just remember, once again, just read over your labs. Everything we're going to ask you is in front of you, all right, in your labs. All right, so know um, why we designed the labs the, the, the way they were, why we use specific um, items in lab, what the purpose behind them was, uh, and what was the purpose of the experiment. A lot of you were able to you, you just tell me stuff, but you had no idea why. We were, were doing certain things, and I remember I always stand in the classroom and tell you guys why we're doing it. And I don't know if, you know, I know it's a lot, it's summer school, um, and it's coming at you very quickly. But you can either memorize stuff for no apparent reason, or you can understand why we're doing it and then memorize it. So when you actually have an application question, you you can work your way mentally through why are they ask us that or what was the importance of that certain thing. All right, um, I will see all of you hopefully on Monday. All right.